We're delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15 Jeopardies of Festival protected by Dettol, Banega Swast India. It's a pleasure to present today, Hello Darling, Rupert Everett in conversation with Siddharth Ganun Shanguri. An element of drama has always attended Rupert Everett even before he swept to fame with his outstanding performance in another country. He has spent his life surrounded by extraordinary people and witnessed extraordinary events. He was in Moscow during the fall of communism, in Berlin the night the wall came down, and in downtown Manhattan on September 11th. By the age of 17, he was friends with Andy Warhol and Bianca Jagger. And since then, he has been up close and personal with some of the most famous women in the world, Julia Roberts, Madonna, Sharon Stone, and Donatella Versace. Everett speaks with Shangui, best-selling author of The Lost Song of Dusk, and most recently, Loss, about the nature of fame, friendship, drama, gossip, and love. Rupert Everett is an actor, writer, and director. He first appeared on stage in 1981 as Guy Bennett in the West End production of Julian Mitchell's play, Another Country, a role which he repeated in the 1984 film version that saw him nominated for a BAFTA as Best Newcomer. Subsequent nominations include a BAFTA and Golden Globe for My Best Friend's Wedding. Siddhartha Nanshangwe is the best-selling author of The Last Song of Dust, The Lost Flamingos of Bombay, The Rabbit and the Squirrel, and most recently Lost, a collection of essays on death and grief. Shangwe has contributed to the New York Times, Time, Vogue, The Times of India, and other publications. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing it in your comments section. Ladies and gentlemen, hello darling. Rupert Everett in conversation with Siddharth Dhanman Shangwe. Siddharth, over to you. How are you, Rupert Everett, and welcome to Jaipur uh, Literature Festival. Is this your first time at JLM? I think it is, yes, and um, I'm just sad I'm not able to be in Jaipur uh, in person. Well, you'll have to come back. It's a wonderful energy. You're going to love it. It is really, truly the most terrific literary festival. And you absolutely would have a host of admirers, readers of your works uh, you'd find there. You know, I just came through uh, watching the, the Happy Prince, and it's such an extraordinary achievement. We should be so proud. There's so much muscle, rigor, and voltage that you really put into this performance. I really salute you and your genius behind it. I wanted to ask you, what were you drawn most to Wiles? you know, this ability for camp and fabulousness well ahead of his time? Or were you drawn to, to while the tragic, uh, uh, defeated, broken figure who wrote Deep Profoundest? What was the, the, the while, you know, inspired you uh, the most? Um, I think very much uh, while as a tragic anti-hero, uh, that's the thing that has always fascinated me. I see Wilde almost as a Christ figure uh, for gay community. Uh, in, uh, in one sense, um, the road to gay liberation uh, mm -hmm. really did start with uh, Oscar Wilde's death, in the sense that Oscar Wilde really, in modern time, was the first person who you could see walking down the street and you could point to him and say, that is a homosexual man. That hadn't mm -hmm. really happened before because in, in Western culture, anyway, it wasn't really a thing that was talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the identity of Wilde uh, made um, the road to liberation begin. And so, mm -hmm. in fact, <coughs> to me, he's a kind of Christ figure. He's rather more uh, easy to identify with uh, than a Christ figure. And he did, you know, die uh, for our sins in a way. And he mm -hmm. was born again in a way. So I find him a very interesting and inspiring character like that. Also, I was very inspired by the mixture he has of being extremely intelligent, extremely clever, extremely talented, and also extremely stupid. Mm. Uh, I find that, uh, that kind of humanity also very Christ-like, because it's what we all battle with inside ourselves, our, our, mm. our intelligent side and, and our foolish side, our vain side. Um, I think he got very caught up in celebrity. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, he was a, he was a very modern character uh, in a way. Uh, he was a, in, in our culture anyway, I think along with Lord Byron, he, they were the two first famous people for, for being famous mm -hmm. and um, beyond their talents. And uh, I, I, so that I found very interesting, the, 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 the rise and the fall of a famous person, uh, the, the vanity and the ego of a famous person uh, is always interesting to observe. And um, so I just, I've always found his last three years much the most interesting 
part of his life. And uh, so that's what really made me want to make a film f focusing on, on that. And you also talk about it, uh, you reconstruct that process, the creative process, in, your, in the third part of your triptych of memoir, uh, to, to the end of the world, which, you know, you really speak of your deep, profound love uh, for while. I wanted to understand if you know that inquiry, that scholarly inquiry that followed through onto the screen, did that reveal a side of while that changed and shifted your perspective about him? Um, no, I always felt, uh, right from uh, the days I, I started being interested in him, I really felt I knew him, you know, I think there's... When you were uh, five? No, not when I was five, no. <laughs> no. When, I, when, I read, when I read stories with my mum, no. Yeah. When I, um, I'm, I'm talking about really when I became a professional in, in the acting business, and mm -hmm. uh, my first wild play was an adaptation of uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and at that point... I felt I began to get under his skin. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not that I am a, an, an admirer so much of him, uh, as the, that I feel that he is every man in a way. I think uh, mm. uh, all the great characters are every man. You can see yourself in, in them. And uh, so I could see my own uh, problems, you know, through him in a way. And, mm. and I felt by the end, I, <clears throat> I felt I knew him very, very well. So, you know, I know that you went off and stayed in the hotel that Oscar Wilde died in Paris. And you also went and stayed in, um, in the hotel in, in Napoli where he lived with Bosi. And I wonder if you could actually recreate, you know, the atmosphere of both those rooms, one with death and the other one lit with romance and, and betrayal. <clears throat> well, uh, the hotel in Paris, uh, should any, uh, any of our viewers be going, is called now L'Hotel and it's uh, just off the Rue Jacob. And I'm afraid, I have to tell you that for me, there was no message at all uh, uh, in my night spent there. I was, you know, I was there sitting, waiting uh, to feel something and I felt absolutely nothing. And uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a disappointing uh, trip. The, the, the hotel room has been redecorated by some very well-meaning person and there's a gigantic painted um, peacock uh, on, on the wall. And mm. it's, uh, it doesn't end up very attractive. The rooms have been reconfigured since uh, Wilde died. Uh, they were still the same up until the 1920s, but now they're very different. The hotel is, is, an, is a nice hotel, uh, in, uh, it, but for me, uh, it, was, it was a disappointment in terms of connecting with Wilde. On the other hand, when I then found the person who uh, lived in the crumble down villa in Naples, in Posilipo, that Wilde lived in, and uh, it's owned by a lady pianist called Kiki. And she was a concert pianist when she was younger. And I went to her house uh, quite a lot and we became friends. And on the full moon, her, the, her, the, the, the villa where she lives, it's, a, it's right on the sea. So the walls of the, the sea splashes against the walls of her house. And on the other side of the bay, you have Vesuvius and Sorrento and the Amalfi Coast. And uh, as dusk comes down, all the lights twinkle and you can see Capri <coughs> and you can see little fishing boats going out with little lights blinking. And at midnight on a full moon, mm -hmm. she played for me the uh, second movement of the Ravel piano concerto and mm. there I did have a kind of experience I really felt mm. that uh, Oscar Wilde uh, was in the room that's the only time I, I felt a kind of presence of him but I think uh, I think he's for the most part gone away and I think you know the trouble with hotel rooms is uh, places to stay sacred have to be untouched I think by human hands too much I think when too many people go around everything and I think that's one of the problems with the mass tourism uh, in the world now it's rather like a kind of glacier moving through um, hills it just drags all the energy with it in a way mm -hmm. and so uh, all our towns are becoming like wedding cakes really they don't have the same feeling in them as they used to because they've been they've been dredged slightly well, when you were talking and describing uh, Naples, I was thinking of a wonderful book, um, which I'm sure you've read by Shirley Hazard, 
um, of, of her time in, in Naples with her husband. Um, and, and that's when she got to know um, Graham Greene and then went on to write a book about him. But I will send you the name of, of I this. Love, I don't know that, uh, that book at all. Yeah, it's a wonderful, small, little, very crisp, beautiful, elegant, Shirley Hazard-like uh, rendition of, of Napoli. You know, what were the parts of your own personality that you believed had resonance with, with Wilde, your personality or certain karmic rhythms that you felt mirrored in your own life um, that allowed you to recreate this so wonderful? I think uh, yeah, there are definitely lots of uh, vibrations or waves, uh, similar waves. I, I don't think I've, I've never had um, his genius, uh, but I have, uh, I think um, the, my, the, the mix between talent and foolishness uh, I think I, I, I've, um, <laughs> I've, I've, I feel very similar in that sense. Vanity, um, blindness, all those things. Uh, I feel I have uh, I've identify uh, myself with with him in that. Uh, I, I don't I don't pretend to be as clever as he was, um, and I don't um, and lots of things I don't. Uh, feel similar but but that mixture of, of having something and ruining it uh, i think mm. is uh, something that I, I identified with early on uh, with him well i just want to um actually just jump in and say that um i think that you have a different kind of genius and when i was reading your books i was thinking so much of how if i wanted to be really glib and i would say that you were the secret love child of fran Leibovitz and marcel proust and then I realized that would be very difficult uh, for multiple reasons to procure, but regardless. <laughs> you know, when, when you look back on, 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 on living Wilde's um, life through your work, what do you think ultimately did him in? Was it his arrogance? The, you know, because there were so many occasions when he could have done a deal and, and gotten out of this uh, mess for himself. Um, or was it his infallible conviction that his genius was going to handhold him through this tragedy? I think the first thing that really undid him was just snobbery, in a way. Mm. I think uh, his uh, affair with Douglas uh, was an act of snobbery. Uh, you have to remember that in uh, those days, being Irish uh, in, in, to the English mm -hmm. was, uh, was, was very, very bad. Uh, mm. They weren't taken seriously at all. And so it's well-known fact that Oscar Wilde, when he arrived from Trinity College in Dublin to Oxford, someone wrote that he changed everything about himself in about 18 days, because mm. up until then he'd spoken with a, an Irish accent. That was put by the wayside. He was very self-invented too, which is another thing that I, 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 I feel uh, exciting about him. And he invented this character, mm. but that character was always aware somewhere of the Irishness. So when he came across this young lord uh, and befriended him and became friends with his mother and his brothers. And mm. uh, at the same time his career was going well and the, the Prince of Wales was going to the theater. He got drunk on uh, being able to write to the Marchioness of Queensbury and saying, you know, I'm so worried about Bosie, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. He was drunk on it in terms of his own ego. He was becoming, uh, something that, he, that, that he'd only dreamt of. He was, he was ingratiating himself into this society that would then turn around and destroy him. But that act of snobbery, I think, was the essential um, problem for him because if he hadn't seen Lord Alfred Douglas through such a, such a lens, he'd have saw him for what he was, which mm. was you know, an amusing uh, person. User. A using a fun user, nothing wrong with the user particularly, but not someone to stake your whole life on, and that of your yeah. wife, and that of your mm -hmm. children. So the selfishness of Wilde at that point, uh, mm -hmm. the grandeur of Wilde, the mm -hmm. blindness is mm -hmm. staggering mm -hmm. uh, and uh, very human because it happens to all of us where it's so easy to get swept away mm -hmm. uh, and to get your head turned completely in the wrong direction. And I think that's in the end the thing that's so tragic and touching about him, that the, 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 it happens to all of us, but he paid. Most of us get away mm. with it, and you mm. manage to, to turn away from uh, the abyss at the last minute. He, he just ran straight over the cliff, mm. and, uh, and the last three years of his life, he paid for that on such an excruciating level that um, mm. 
that it's just it's a very moving that's what makes the story moving to me you know i also want to say that as i was reading your books i felt so much and i hope that all the readers um and viewers at jlf are going to go out and get to the end of the world are going to get red carpet and other banana skins and vanishes and 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 hello darling and really uh sink into it um i was wondering if you can retrace the world in the 80s when it was so glamorous um you were a young actor really uh getting the kind of traction that most people could only dream about and then there was this very dark soundtrack that was also playing out which was of the aids epidemic and you know young men dying everywhere you lived through that uh, i wonder if covid uh, was triggering you know that it brought back memories and a kind of a, a a very familiar drum circle from another very dark time um and i i th- i think in a way uh, anyone who lived through the aids period <laughs> feels a little bit defensive about it in a way in comparison mm-hmm. to covid uh, because covid uh, even though it has had uh, such a terrible uh, effect on old people uh, sick people um uh and and various not so many completely healthy people in terms of death uh, aids was something that once you got that was it there was no way back there was no one being particularly friendly to you uh you know when when it all started i remember if you went out uh, to a meal as a gay person with say a family you'd notice out of the corner of your eye someone collecting your plates very carefully to go and wash mm. them uh, there was a stigma involved that there really hasn't been with covid and mm. also uh, it, it was a death sentence mm. uh, nobody in uh, you know the the world whipped itself up into a complete frenzy over mm. covid this did not happen uh, for aids mm. and by the way aids still kills uh, 1.9 million people a year in mm. the world so still a, a, a much bigger um mm-hmm. pandemic uh, than 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 the covid pandemic so mm-hmm. but anyway it's not a competition between uh, pandemics mm-hmm. i'm only saying this to say that when you did leave, live through that you feel a little bit defensive about it because it was such an extraordinary and uh, not for me personally because i was lucky enough not to get it but for people who got it it was a bleak moment because mm-hmm. uh, you were fed the wrong drugs they helped kill you really uh you were sent away from hospitals when they thought they could do nothing else for you nobody wanted to help look after you uh you um there was nobody who would hold your hand without wearing a glove and a suit uh you were literally left on your own uh on the whole for the first wave of hiv to die and it was blamed on uh god's revenge on humanity uh and uh it was a hedonism <laughs> hedonism and that we had got something so wrong and uh i think it's something that's hard to forget that mm. uh, uh to forgive maybe but to forget it's it's difficult i remember you know there is a wonderful collection of essays um that was edited by edmund white which was called lost within lost and i think it explored the idea mm. of how when an artist dies not only do you lose the mortal self of, of the artist the the person who that goes but you also lose the work that they could have made had they been alive and i find that is a wonderfully poignant what what did you lose friends were there people that you lost from that time that you remember and mourn um <clears throat> many many people uh, i i lost uh, <clears throat> many friends uh, to aids and um you didn't know you couldn't know by in those early days whether you had it or not the hiv test uh, in 1988 or 1989 so mm-hmm. at first you didn't know you had it you were it was like holding a a loaded revolver in your hand nobody knew what was going on so mm-hmm. any any slight sign of a cough or flu uh, you thought your your number was up um but yes i i lost many friends and um and i i and i i also have many survivors uh, yeah. because a lot of people made it through to the triple therapy uh, moment the triple therapy came just hanging on by their fingernails mm. sort of thing and uh, a lot of those people are, are around and uh, leading you know fantastic lives i think uh, for all of them there is a kind of uh, post traumatic stress uh, in mm. in in having lived through the disease because mm. it really wasn't 
it wasn't something that anybody felt comfortable with uh, treating you, seeing you. It was uh, it, when you did find people who were sympathetic or or compassionate. It was it was rare at first, as opposed to the norm. So, Rupert, the reason I really am telling all all the people who are tuning in to read your books is because I feel that no one's written about show business with such clarity and precision. I think that two people have come to mind. One is Truman Capote, you know, uh, writing about Marilyn Monroe, I think in The New Yorker, or there's uh, more recently, who I think writes really beautifully about show business is Tina Fey, uh, you know, when she wrote her memoir, Bossy Pants. And I think, you know, it's a triptych of gods. I, I would include you in that. So I want to actually now move from the slightly more somber part of the conversation to something a little more lighter and fun. If you'll permit me, and if you can talk about the, the glamorous chick, um, you know, parts of your life and, uh, and that, you know, um, fame consumed uh, decade or two that you really enjoyed and you were the king of at that point of time. I remember you writing really beautifully about Julia Roberts. What was her greatest strength? What was the quality about her that you admire the most? Um, I think uh, what I loved about all those women uh, that I met at that point and being really at that point in, in Hollywood, I was really the only kind of openly homosexual man around. So I had this very mm. great, the people who supported me most were these girls uh, mm. who I got on really, really well with. Uh, uh, I was trying to jump them. Uh, so maybe uh, that was nice. They didn't want to jump me, uh, but I was, we, we, it worked between uh, me and Julie, we, we, I could, I could be a walker. Uh, we could have a great laugh together. She was, um, she is an incredible force of nature. Uh, you know, those girls, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, we, we've now learned from the Me Too movement in a way, how hazardous the journey uh, <laughs> from downstream to uh, stardom is for a girl, oh. because you have to know it's very difficult, you know, because it's it's a it's a sexual business. I mean, or it was a sexual business. So uh, you don't want to go out uh, with a producer as a girl mm -hmm. and for him to say to you, by the way, you remind me of my sister. I love you. That's not what you need. You need him to say, mm -hmm. God, you are the sexiest thing on the planet. But you also need for him not to feel he has the right then to uh, just take you wherever he wants you. And mm -hmm. those girls, uh, the Madonnas, the Julia Roberts, they understood this uh, this mm. this side of the deal very very well, and they had the nerve and the balls, uh, in a way. They have they all have quite a masculine side to them to keep these men in the place that they they needed to be, and mm -hmm. that's why I think uh, th there's a tenacity and there's a force in those women uh, mm. that that is is the kind of force that goes through the screen through the footlights and into the hearts of the audience. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of spiritual, uh, energetic mm. um, focus, uh, um, uh, which is uh, extraordinary uh, and fascinating to, to be on the sidelines of and to watch. Uh, whether they're all, uh, you know, particularly nice people or not, I don't know. For mm. me, that's been really the aim. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I was just fascinated about how these women could really win in this very male world. It's, it, was a, it's a, it, it, it was a very, you know, heterosexual male world. And uh, being a woman was complicated in it. Isaac Dimson had a word for it, right? I think she called them Pantherina. So mm -hmm. it was such a wonderful uh, word because it really fuses that kind of energy and voltage that a real star has because they know that they're communicating. They know that they have that energy and that light to put up and, and you're hungry for it. And they're aware of that hunger. Um, Andy Warhol, what was he like? What, did you enjoy your time? Did you think he was a great artist or just another New York hustler? Um, I thought, you know, there was a, there was a direct uh, line for a certain type of English person who mm. uh, mostly from kind of the middle classes or the upper classes, uh, who always had a direct route. You could go to, when you were first went to New York, you could always ring up the factory and say you were a friend of so-and-so's and could you come around? And Andy, I was great friends when I was very young, aged about 17, with Bianca Jagger. And so uh, with her, I'd spent a lot of time um, at the factory and uh, a lot of time with Andy. And um, 
the thing about Andy was he was um, he didn't really give much away. He just said, "Oh, that's great!" all the time, and you know he was filming, photographing, recording, and mm. um, he was a he was an easy person to be with. Uh, he mm. didn't mind silent. Uh, he loved. He he could he could. I feel rather like him now, actually. Because I live in Brazil a lot, and uh, I don't really speak very much Portuguese, I, I find myself kind of uh, quite silent in groups of people, mm. and it rem I remind myself that slightly not that I'm recording and photographing of Andy, but um, Andy was uh, really fun and nice, and uh, and he, I mean, at the time I knew him, he loved, he was always out every night, all night, and anywhere you went, uh, you'd find him, and um, there was a whole coterie of uh, people in New York like that. I mean, it, New York is so changed now since uh, those days, but, um, and it's- Did Donatella Versace ever give you a fashion hack that stayed with you? Uh, uh, did you give me a what? A fashion hack that stayed with you. Uh, like a fashion, it? like a trick, like something that, you know, wear a mink coat if someone's died. Like, I don't know, something that- <clears throat> Um, no, she 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 hasn't. She never gave me any fashion tips. She she dressed me a lot and gave me uh, lots of wonderful clothes. And I remember one um, Oscars. Uh, she dressed uh, me and Madonna in uh, dark um, kind of purple navy. And um, and she was uh, she's an amazing woman too. Uh, another uh, extraordinary woman. And. Um, it all seems like a, an extraordinary dream now because the world has shifted uh, to mm. such an extent uh, in the last really five years. Uh, and I suppose that's what growing older is always about, how the older generation kind of looks at the younger one and thinks they're insane. Uh, but I've got to that point now slightly. <laughs> one of the things that really runs through the, the, three, uh, the three books that make up your memoir is um, you know, your various lenses on friendship and how your relationship uh, with people changes over time. I was wondering um, if you had been able to come to terms with knowing the best way to end a friendship. Come to terms with knowing what the best way to end a friendship. Best way to, the, the smartest way to end a friendship. What's the best way to do that? I think friendships drift. Uh, really, uh, mm. that's the thing about friendship mm. and relationships. Everything drifts, and um, I am not one of those people who is decisive. Uh, uh, I've uh, very rarely um, ended a friendship. I found what happens normally, especially nowadays, where everyone is so kind of dispersed around the world. You just suddenly realize you haven't seen somebody for two years, and then you mm -hmm. see them one time, and, and now you have very much to say, and that's it. Friendship is kind of mm. uh, evaporated. Um, mm. But um, I think uh, the, uh, the older uh, I get, the more I value friendships that have, have gone on for a long time. Mm. So um, I have um, two or three friends from when I was about six or seven. I have about two more from when I was 15. And I have about 10 or 12 from when I was 18. And uh, those I've and and then and then I stopped making friends really when I was about forty probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, the ones I've kept, um, I, I feel you know that that longevity, that breadth of experience together is is wonderful because at a certain point you don't need to say anything and to communicate. Mm -hmm. You kind of everything comes in a sort of shorthand, in a mm -hmm. way. But the um, friends, is, uh, I think, is a very easy thing. They just they everything with us at a certain point. Um, and um, which is fine as well, I think. So I believe you now have a, a quieter life. And I think that um, uh, I'm very interested to know a little about that. I, I believe that you spend a lot of time with your mom. Isn't that wonderful? I think it's so cool. You're like an Indian son, Rupert. You're an honorary Indian. Uh, and also I was thinking, you know, when, um, when you were all singing in uh, my best friend's wedding, right? I mean, that's like a ride out of Bollywood. They're all at a restaurant. And each of them begins right. to sing. <laughs> and it couldn't be more Bollywood than that. So you, you, you. Oh, actually, I needed to tell you that, you know, many years ago, um, I think you were doing a documentary for, um, for a television channel on, on Richard Burton. That's right. I was in India. Yeah. And, you know, I was supposed to host a dinner for you. 
And I had, I had to cancel last minute and then I set it up with a different friend of mine uh, who I, I think he did host, uh, host you. And so I wanted to know, what do you remember that dinner at all? It was in suburban Bombay at a friend's house. It was kind of glamorous. We filmed the dinner. It was great. Okay, uh, wonderful. I think we even filmed it. It's, in, it's part of the, our Richard Burton documentary. And, we, and uh, no, it was, it was, uh, I remember it very well. And uh, because I was kind of acting my own version of Richard Burton uh, yeah. in the documentary. So this dinner party, uh, which was uh, quite glamorous, uh, very nice. It was, um, it, was, it, it was great in the documentary. Well, it was, that was a dinner you party were... I was supposed to host. Unfortunately, I had to cancel. I was, I was, I was I, you know, it's always said to me, I said, okay, now this is it. I get to complete that conversation and tell you, come back to Bombay and I'll host the dinner party. Uh, okay, I want to talk. A few quick questions about your writing process. How do you write? Do you like what? What is that for you like? Can you tell me? Uh, <clears throat> do you it's very, very difficult uh, for me? Um, and at the moment, I've been trying to write for the last uh, two months, and um, I haven't come up with anything. So uh, I think uh, for me, it's always been quite difficult. Uh, being an actor, you you're used to working in a group, and being a writer, you're working on your own. And I think that's one of the things that's very difficult uh, in, in a group of actors. In a group yeah. of actors, uh, everyone motivates everyone else. And as a writer, you've just got yourself. And uh, I am at a crossroads right now with writing because I just don't know if I have anything more to say. I feel like I'm regurgitating uh, patterns and phrases and words that I've used before. And I haven't moved... I don't feel I've moved on uh, enough to to uh, to be successful at the moment. So I'm I'm in a in a in a difficult spot. But um, I think the main thing is you just have to keep going. That's that's it. You have to keep going back to it and back to it. However, sometimes I only last for about eight minutes until I uh, until I just I lose heart. Um, open a bottle of wine. Solitary. Huh? And or open a bottle like of wine. Joan Didion used to drink hot gin and hot water. Wonderful, I remember uh, she, that. <clears throat> yeah, she, she wrote very well about uh, celebrity too, by the way. She did, absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful essays from her time in Los Angeles. Tell me, how do you reconcile the very public role of being an actor with the very private act of being uh, a writer? You know, there are two kind of very different vocations that feed into each other. How do you kind of find a middle ground between them? Well, I think one came up when the other went down, in a way, mm. uh, for me. So I don't, um, I, 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 last year I did act a lot, but um, not so, uh, it's not so all engulfing uh, for me uh, now. So, uh, I, and I am a much more, um, I suppose, private or, so, or quiet living person now. Um, like you said, living with my mother. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't live with my mother, I live next door to my mother, but, uh, but I, live, I live mostly in the, in the outside of the city now example mm -hmm. i'm not very i don't like going out to parties i don't like uh, any of those things that i used to like so that whole promotional side of being an actor is, is has really stopped me in a way so uh, um the writing side suits me quite well if only i could write but i can't well maybe you have to come back to bombay and figure it out now tell me um you've written a whole st um, memoirs. Are you going to now take a stab at fiction? Are you going to write a novel? Or uh, um... I'm writing two books at the moment. I'm writing, but uh, the one I'm having troubles with is um, I'm writing um, a, a, a set of short stories, and um, and they were the stories that I I had this idea of writing all the stories that I pitched over the years to be movies, and they've all failed, obviously, <laughs> and. Now that I'm writing them, I'm thinking, oh my God, everyone's going to see, oh, well, now we know why they fail, because they're just not working. <laughs> uh, so that's what I um, am doing at the moment. I think you're, I might have to come to India uh, if it's opened up again. Jodhpur is the place I like to go and write, because they have a, I've stayed in a hotel there once, and I wrote hmm. and wrote, wrote. It was unbelievable. I don't know if you know, Bruce so Chatwin might... also had the same experience in Rajasthan. You know, he mm -hmm. completed it. Yeah, Bruce Chapman wrote a part of one of his most important books in India that he finished in, in because his widow had, um, his wife at the time, now his widow, had uh, an estate there and continues to have an estate in, uh, in, in rural Rajasthan. Yeah. 
So Rupert Everett, we're so happy to have you at Jaipur. And I know for a fact that uh, we've got to get you back in live, in person. So this is just a precursor. This is just a first course. Thank you for such a riveting conversation for all your readers and your uh, viewers in India and beyond. Thank you for coming to JLF and for this and the gift of this conversation. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to speak to you. And thank you too. I'm so glad you're feeling better. And uh, next time you've got to give that dinner party. <laughs> Absolutely. I shall do. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rupert Everett and Siddhartham and Shangri for that extraordinary conversation. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. Please stay locked on to continue to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Sessions are ongoing across all three of our venues, Front Lawn, Mughal Tent and Darbar Hall. Hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.